Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was so I so a lot of the writing really have no idea what it Thanks for joining me tonight. I was really hoping there'd be food. Did you guys eat beforehand? No. Well, I did actually. Okay. I went to Cafe Versailles, and I'm still smelling it. <laughs> Don't burn, please. Thanks I'm for sharing. We're still smelling it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the correction, Jude. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for joining me. Um, I'm going to start off with probably a juvenile approach here, but I hope you don't take it that way. Um, we hear so often about how TV's changing and people are watching on different platforms. You know, Xbox is coming out with stuff, AOL's coming out with stuff. So I want to go around the table and maybe if you guys can first, I mean, in one word, how would you describe TV today? And if you want to elaborate on that word. One word. Um, being to the left of you is really painful right now. <laughs> um, one word. Um, is avant-garde two words? That's two, that's, I, two I, words. I, I, that's I think it counts. I don't know. I, ju I just think that all the, it seems like right now that all the progressive stuff is happening one word, on one television. One word, buddy. <laughs> No, but oh, wait, elaborate. then I got to elaborate. Oh. I picked my word and then oh. I'm elaborating them. Now we have to elaborate? <laughs> yeah, I Sounds like someone's got her word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to say, I, you know, the. the, the, the avant garde. Well, I'm, well, not avant garde. It's not the right word. Uh, the word I'm looking because Because in the, the original, the, the, the definition of the French is the, f is, is the front of the line and the, the, the pioneering spirit right now. It seems like. A lot of what's happening in television is uh, is really progressive, and you know, I, I look at the movies and I look at some of these television shows, and there's a lot of these television shows I'd rather watch. Um, so I I, uh, it's not avant-garde, but it's something, something progressive. Something progressive is pro how about progressive? We'll, we'll take progressive. Thank you, thank you, Juliana. It was good. It was good. Thanks. Um, I think it's the golden age of television. That's not one word. But I don't have to elaborate on that because I said it all. <laughs> I think I, I, I agree with Liev. I think there, it's, un, it's a time when um, Graydon Carter wrote it somewhere where he said there was a time when, when uh, he was a kid and movies were for adults and TV were, was for children. Mm -hmm. And now it feels like TV seems to be for adults and the movies are all the sequels and prequels and God knows what for children. And so it just it feels like um, we've matured in the television world mm -hmm. to a higher standard. I agree. Your turn, Vera. <laughs> I got a few words, but I'll, I, I evolved, I guess. Um, just the evolution of I think technology and um, and uh, it's changed the way we we receive stories. You know, I think film used to be holier just in sort of the, the, the construct of it. You are looking up at a screen. It's dark. There's a mysticism there. You're, it's meant to be seen within a congregation of an audience. You know, hopefully if the, if the story is good, you'll walk away enlightened and, and transcendent. But I think the hustle and bustle of life, I don't remember last time I went to a, and paid for a ticket because I live upstate New York. I don't have half hour to travel there, half hour to watch uh, previews mm -hmm. and then, you know, and, and then drive home another half hour. I, I, I want it now. And yet we are, we're all so disconnected, I think, with technology that we're, we're craving that connection. Mm -hmm. I think television episodics in particular, I think, have become more important and vital. And, 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 and you know, we, we're yearning to make these connections with these characters. Um, and so television has just become more important. Mm -hmm and independent. What was my word? <laughs> Evolved. 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 That was a good one. That was a solid word. A really good one. That was really good. Um, we'll have to follow that. Wow. Um, I don't know, daring or brave, both, both those words. I mean, I grew up watching like Happy Days and stuff. and. You know, nobody ever says, do you, you see what happened last night on Happy Days? And I love Happy Days. <laughs> but, you know, like, people sit around water coolers now, and they're like, you know, don't tell me, you know, don't tell me what happened. So, um, you know, it's interesting. It's, um, I remember when I first started acting, you know, somebody would say, oh, guess what, I got this TV show. And you go, oh, it's cool, just keep trying. <laughs> yeah, it'll get better. Right. 
and TV. now TV is where it's at. I mean, television's so good now, and and I'm a huge fan of all the shows. I watch everything, and I never used to do that. So um, I don't know, but it's it's like she said. I mean, with all the technology and everything, it um uh, it keeps people tuned in and hanging on the edges edges of their seats. So it's daring, good word, Lizzie. Um, I'm going to go with multi-layered. I was just going to say layered, mm -hmm. but then I realized we could use uh, hyphens, yeah. so <laughs> I'm going to go multi-layered. Uh, I think that in making a, a show on cable, or really anywhere now, um, you get to tell a 12-hour long story. And television, certainly when I started out, you had to tell a beginning, middle, and an end within one episode. And now we get to tell these stories over such a long stretch of time that we get to tell them really, really well and with so much detail and so much nuance. And you don't get to do that in a movie because you do have to wrap it up in a couple hours generally. And so I agree. I think uh, movies are old news. Not really. I really would like don't to do a lot of movies. Don't say old news the LA Times I know. <laughs> 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 It's the worst thing you can say. <laughs> I, I would piggyback on what, what Lizzie said and, and to a certain point what, what, what Vera said as well and just say creative. Uh, it's, it's given these, these storytellers so many more opportunities to tell their stories in, in, in a creative way. They're not beholden to a procedural element where they have to, like Lizzie was saying, have to wrap it up in 48 minutes or however long. Um, and there's also so much more uh, leeway and opportunity in how you distribute your content. As you mentioned, whether it's over Xbox or AOL or or Netflix or um, you know fill in the blank, you can watch it. On, I, I watched the first season of Damages on my phone. I mean, and that was when it, that was years ago, and and now it's even easier to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the creativity in distributing content, as well as the creativity of the content, have both kind of ramped up significantly mm -hmm. from the days when we were all kids watching TV. There's just so many more avenues to get to get it out there. And what Juliana said is, is actually quite true and what Lizzie kind of picked up on as well. It's just like movies are, are you know, a, a different thing at this point. They're, they exist to sell merchandise or they exist to sell toys instead of ins and appeal to a certain, you know, segment of the demographic that does go out and does spend money because they don't have jobs and they don't have kids and they don't have to drive a half an hour to get someplace. They're kids and they live there and they want to go see whatever the movie is. And sometimes those those movies can be quite good. I loved the Lego movie. I was like, man, this movie's great. Um, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. I, I literally walked out singing that song and wanted to go see it again. Um, <coughs> the irony was not lost on me. But, uh, but those are few and far between, it seems. Mm -hmm. And again, in that world, it's, it's become so diluted with those uh, those types of films that the, the little ones that do have a story or do have something original or interesting to say get kind of lost in the noise. Mm -hmm. Whereas I feel like with on the, in the television landscape, the, the, the shows that are represented here are telling stories that are being elevated out of the noise and, and celebrated and people are watching them, are talking about them and are, you know, blogging about them and writing critiques about them and, and really engaging with them as a, 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 the way that we used to do with the movies. Right. Well, I'm going to add a word that piggybacks off of everyone and say overwhelming. As a TV reporter, um, my DVR space is constantly full, like Sunday especially, like I, there's just not enough time. And I like go to sleep at like 3 a.m. sometimes because I like want to see everything. That's the problem is I want to catch up on Monkey Dan. I want to see Good Wife. I want to see Ray. I want to see Mad Men. I want to see Bates. I want to see Masters of Sex. So it's like... Are all our shows on Sunday night? All but Vera's, I believe. Oh my God, that's horrible. That's wild. Yeah, we should hate each other. <laughs> Death match. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of you have uh, been with your characters for quite some time, some longer than others, but is there something about your character that frustrates you or a moment that has frustrated you about your character? that you wish they acted differently in a moment, or? or mostly every single moment of my <laughs> character's existence is a frustrating element because it's, it's just a continual series of making poor decisions. But I mean, I, that, that can be interesting as well. Um, that's part of, you know, if, if it was just, if you were just telling stories about people that made mm -hmm. great decisions all the time, everyone would be Superman and, and, right. and it would be um, the perfect world. 
I think we find that that a storytelling arc is more interesting when they're when you go left when you should have gone right, mm. um, and then you set up you know trying to get back to right. I think that's the that's the point. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Has there been a moment though where you were like, I would have acted differently, or I wish she wouldn't have done that, or he wouldn't have done that? They had, they had my character taking, but one of the earlier scripts was he takes his brother's drugs and he's had a, said a bunch of racist stuff and <clears throat> I worked with him and, and changed it to, uh, I said I'd rather be an Al-Anon member than an Alcoholics Anonymous member. I'd rather grow up in that world and hate it. Mm -hmm. So they allowed me to change a lot of things and wh where I found it more interesting. And, but I found that with television, I'd never really been on, t on TV before, but you get this opportunity to sort of drop these little seeds behind you as you do other things and sometimes those seeds turn into trees and storylines and all these other things so you kind of indirectly get to mold where you where you're headed you know <clears throat> yeah i don't really think it's it's our job to to judge what our characters do or see it as right or wrong mm -hmm. or compare it to how we as people in real life would behave it's more how can we justify these things that they do how do we make these the right decisions for the characters in real time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's kind of our job. And, and how, how best do we, as court-appointed lawyers, defend that character, defend that character's choice for doing that? I'm with John, I disagree with everything mm -hmm. <laughs> that Norma Bates, uh, her choices, but I mean, her, her whole life is a construct of lies. You know, uh, just b she's built big brick by brick. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I love defending that. Yeah. I, I just, I, I mean, I think it's one of the things that I find interesting in listening to all these actors talk about their roles that, that is indicative of the quality of television now, nowadays that, that as actors were allowed characters with duality. And, and, and uh, I, I think that's, you know, that's, the, that's something that actors love, um, you know, um, to be able to uh, contain uh, something in its opposite mm -hmm. is really a wonderful exercise, and, and uh, I, I think that uh, that's something that Ann Bitterman does really well mm -hmm. on uh, Ray Donovan. Um, but I ag agree with Lizzie that it, it, I, I never try not to judge my characters, you know. Um, or now that I'm on a television show, character. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, no, I I I, en I enjoy it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, one of the things that you know. I was always a I was always a little intimidated by film acting. Um, yeah, the, I mean, I enjoyed it and it was great, especially, especially when I paid off my student loans, but <laughs> there was something, uh, there was a pressure to it. That la th th there's something about language that I, that I really enjoyed that, that was something maybe that I, I hid behind a little bit. And, and it's very interesting to me to play a guy who doesn't it's talk a lot. Doesn't talk a lot. Um, because it's, it's actually nothing like <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> But that was that was it's a sort of a lesson in film acting for me. This is sort of that experience. And uh, sometimes I wish that he had more lines, and I realized, no, that's not what this is about. It's mm -hmm. about it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of exercise. My biggest concern for Ray was I was worried that he's never laughed before. And then finally, we see there was a. I think it was the first time he laughed was when remembering his sister, like memories of her. But yeah, I was like, I hope he like laughs sometimes. It's not always so dark. You know, I, I, I was, in the beginning, you don't, get di I, you don't get directed as much as you do in the theater and television because these directors come in and they're sort of behind the relationships, you know, that everyone else has been there and mm -hmm. they don't know you as well and so they sort of defer to you a lot, which I don't, I wasn't really accustomed to. I'm accustomed to being directed. Mm -hmm. And so I'm talking to David Nevins, who's uh, the head of Showtime, and, and, and <laughs> I remember after the third episode, he, and I guess he'd seen some rough cuts, he just he simply said to me, you know, Leah, I've been, might be good to find a couple of places to smile. <laughs> okay, I'll try. So. How about Juliana? I mean, there are moments where I know myself watching Alicia. I wish she would have like kissed Will in a certain moment, or like, you know, given Peter the finger in another moment. Had there been moments for you where you were frustrated with her? Oh, ah, uh, yeah. I mean. You know, I, but again, it's the joy of playing it. It's the challenge, and it's what makes you know. It, it's what makes it fun as an actor is to play. She's so opposite from who I am. I mean, I, and I also, oftentimes wish I was more like her. 
you know, she absolutely thinks before she says a word. And there's this um, incredible stillness about her that I don't have, I'm just not that disciplined. Mm -hmm. I say what I feel. Um, I, w I think she holds things in too much. It drives me crazy. I just want her to yell and break down and be human. She almost sometimes seems like she'd rather just hide in her own shell than express her feelings, mm -hmm. which is actually why I've ac actually asked for next season for her to have a shrink. <laughs> I like, gonna, she's going to combust, man. you okay. got to give her somebody. Perfect segue. I was going to say, how many of you think your character should be in therapy? <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure, Alicia should be in therapy. We saw Norma try it, but yeah. What would things be like if they were in therapy? Uh, uh, unaffective for, for, for Don. <laughs> I think that would not, uh, it would not hold. I mean, uh, as, as Vera was saying about Norma, like it's when, you're, when your existence is... is you know, the foundation of your existence is based on a lie. You either blow up that lie and start completely over, or you build a house on that foundation knowing that it's going to fall down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, many, in, in many ways, the, 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 the big part of Don's story is the, is the, is the crumbling of that foundation and, and uh, having to deal with what then, what do you do then. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily, I think, I don't think he's a very a good candidate for therapy. <laughs> Norman, what would you kidding? <laughs> Do you think there's a therapist you out there? Gotta be joking. <laughs> um, what What would his uh, first session be about? First off, he'd probably try to stab him. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mur uh, murder might come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jesus, uh, that's a whole show right there. Um, Spin off. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's. I remember the first day on set and. Um, it, the first thing I have to say is I haven't even met the actors yet. They're all friends. They've all done all the press together. And I have to say this thing about, you know, can we cut off the bit that the zombie chewed off the deer and still eat the deer? And I'm looking up at them for the first time and they're looking at me like, you idiot. You know what I mean? And the next thing I have to come up and I have to, I have to scream to Merle to eat squirrels. And I'm, I'm holding squirrels, right? And I'm like, how do you want? Should I, should I lasso this? Should I just throw, you know? It, very confusing first day. Um, but I get, I get, I get over there. I mean, it was insane. It was weirdly a lot like Lizzie's first day on Master. <laughs> exactly so. the same. How do you it want this? Exactly the same story? conversation. <laughs> but but I, I get, I get over there and I turn around after they tell me all this stuff and, and I look at all these actors and they're just staring at me and I'm like, okay, here, this, uh -huh. this is who this guy is. And he's like, no, he doesn't think anyone likes him. Like he's got a chip on his shoulder, super huge. But, I mean, to take that kid into therapy, like, oh, my God, like, I don't even know where to begin to answer mm -hmm. the question. I don't think it would go over well. Though. I want Ray to go to therapy. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a different, Those it's, a, it's a whole different culture. It's a whole, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, we try a little bit this season, it's just, but it's not a, I don't know. It's yeah. not, it's not, it's not, doesn't do anything mm -hmm. for him. How about Alicia? I mean, we see that she's going through a little d depression following the death of... I, I, I personally would love to see her in therapy, but she's such a wasp and she's so... Um, I, I don't think she understands... I think it would be fascinating. Yeah. I'd love to see her in therapy, but I don't think it would work for her and I don't think the writers like the idea of it at all mm -hmm. because part of what makes Alicia Alicia is mm -hmm. that she doesn't go to therapy. <laughs> right. You know, it keeps the character. Um, I just, I just feel like, yeah, after playing a character for five years, and sort of seeing this tightly wound ball um, only come undone when there's a tragedy, um, be and in the privacy of her own bedroom, I just feel like um, it's also really hard as an actor to constantly break down alone in an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> or in yeah. your bedroom, and the door closes and she breaks down. It's a very when you speak to someone and you have lines that can get you to a place emotionally, it's not so hard. But I do more phone acting, <clears throat> and now that every character on television has a cell phone, yes. except, well, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> actually, the three of you don't, right? <laughs> well, you don't either, do you? Yes, you do. But, you know, it's, it's a whole new world with acting. I keep saying, I'm like, they're like, and you're walking through and you're checking your Blackberry. And, and I always think, oh my God. We would never do that on ER, you know, like we'd never have that distraction. And now we have a lot of this sort of personal to 
hand phone ac acting, mm -hmm. and I find it a little disconcerting. Hmm. Well, let's carry on with the, the challenges that you faced in this past or recent season uh, and how you sort of work through them. Who wants to go first? What was the most challenging scene? Uh, well, um, the most recent episode of Mad Men that just aired was, was Don basically coming back to the office. Mm -hmm. And uh, after having been fired at the end of season six and sort of or, or put on leave at the mm -hmm. end of season six and, and uh, the way it was handled was that he comes back but no one knows he's coming back. And so he has that incredibly awkward sort of first day of school moment mm -hmm. where everyone's staring at him and he doesn't really know anybody. There have been personnel changes and people are in different offices and what's happening and there's new people. and. And it's tremendously awkward, and and shooting it was tremendously awkward because it was a, it had represented itself as a place that my character had not only founded, mm -hmm. created, but was very comfortable in, and and now it had been completely turned around, and he was completely uncomfortable, and it was it was physically very uncomfortable to be to be that person that no one's really paying attention right. to, and and everyone is sort of whispering yeah. about and side-eyeing and um Joan too I was like Joan be nicer to Don listen, never, it's, <laughs> it's, he's, he's not anybody's favorite yeah. person at this point but yeah. uh but it was it was it was real I mean it very much felt like what it was which was this awkward out of place um thing and it was mm -hmm. represented in the way he was treated by Stan and Peggy and mm -hmm. Joan and Ian Cutler and Lou and mm -hmm. everyone else it was it was it felt very real and Did they all give you hugs after? No. No? <laughs> Not a huggy set. <laughs> Lizzie? I mean, I can imagine. Or is it not? It's not. Really? It's not. But you don't even have to ask the question. <laughs> um, no, rarely are, you know, like, sex and nudity scenes the, the most, most difficult. Uh -huh. uh, because I'm very drunk during those scenes. <laughs> Um, I think um, uh, probably the most the most difficult <laughs> scene for Virginia was when Masters offers to pay her for her participation in the study, which you know equates to calling her a, a prostitute and you know sort of stripping away everything mm -hmm. that uh, they've built up together this partnership. And mm -hmm. the first season of my show, I see it as sort of a like an origin story mm -hmm. for this team. And so, you know, I don't remember what, like probably halfway through, a little past halfway through, he strips away this thing that they've been building. Right. And it is a strange thing, like he had other secretaries. And then uh, Caitlin Fitzgerald, who mm -hmm. plays his wife, comes in and she's his secretary and they're doing the presentation right. together. And it's, it's a weird thing how, like, I, I was jealous. I right. was like doing all this other stuff. And, you know, I love all the, the other storylines that I do, but when I'm not, just front and center in in master's life, yeah. I kind of get a little itchy. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really strange. And this, well, I don't really want to. I don't think I'm supposed to talk about this season. But it's you know the the dynamic between the two of them is is constantly two steps forward, one step back. One of them feels too close and pulls back. Mm -hmm. And the first season it was mostly masters who would sort of well, take me yeah. along, and then when Make he it, got yeah. uncomfortable, just sort of rip the rug out from beneath me. Mm -hmm. And that. It gets exhausting right. after a while. Norman? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was a, one episode called Still that was a two-parter that was really exhausting. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the thing about that character is he's so, he acts so tough and he's so not a tough guy inside, you know? Um, I mean, that whole, that whole range to go from like a grunting, angry guy to a little kid to, to somebody that opens up, was that whole thing was a drag. But the dynamic with Daryl and his brother, every time that would happen, so last season probably stabbing, you know, seeing him. Because he's always tough, but when he sees his big brother, he sort of goes back down yeah. to little brother guy. So um, that was hard. Like, and, and plus, just because you say goodbye to someone that you work with and it was right. your friend, that's there's that. Um, but th I think that stuff, the, the the stabbing of Merle and killing him and dealing with that, that was hard. Vera, uh, is, um, it, is it yelling Norman like, <laughs> like the top of your lungs? Um, 
you know, she's, Norma is, uh, I don't know, she just, I mean, the character has got, like, Tolstoy's ego and, and Dostoevsky's, like, torment, and so it requires a lot of, like, emotional endurance, and I'm like a balloon, you know, if, if, and it, I, there's I have several scenes, yeah, my, my so the, the, the storyline with her brother coming, and, uh, um, the incest past between them and having to tell Dylan that he's a product, my, my oldest son, that he's a product of that, that incest. It, 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 my, I think what's challenging for me, and this keeps happening with every one of these scenes, is a scene coming up with Norman in the finale that is, that was really, um, required a lot of tenacity and endurance. And um, what's challenging for me, they always shoot him around lunch. And so I, I hate going to lunch, and then by that time you've, you know, you've already expended your energy, so you just go for the comfort food, and, you know, I'm like, I load up on mac and cheese, and I come back, and, the <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not working anymore, but it's my close-up. Right. That's always like that. And that's, that's what I find most challenging. That is you so know? brutally I don't want to go, like, <laughs> I don't want to go to lunch. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think that's, like, that's where... Lunch is a bitch. <laughs> Lunch is a bitch. I think there's a difference between what's hard for Ray and what's hard for me. Mm. Lunch is lunch is difficult. Lunch is difficult <laughs> for Liev or oh, Ray. Yeah, lunch is difficult for Liev. Okay. I'm taking I don't like taking my clothes off. <laughs> I don't like putting my junk in that little speedo flesh colored thing and you do at lunch. I know. <laughs> That's different. That's what I do at lunch. I don't like doing that in front of the crew with an actress I don't know very well. But Are I talking about lunch I or know, sex? I'm so confused. What when you wear the little speedo? Why are you wearing the speedo at lunch? Cuz it's sun. We're in LA. Way. It's not uh. New York. No. Uh, John was John was mixing metaphors. Uh. No. Uh. <laughs> We shot a scene today, and I mean, really, that is the thing. When you do this every day, you know, it's like when you do this every day, it is about pacing yourself, and it's about your energy and how you eat, and it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't, I think, um, I didn't realize how athletic acting was. I mean, I knew that from the theater that, you know, you're doing eight shows a week, you got to be fit to do it, but this really is a long haul, and you have to pace yourself during the day, and you have to pace yourself for the run of the season. Right. It's physically really demanding stuff. Um, but I, we shot something today with, with Ray's daughter, um, played by uh, Karis, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, Bridget is his daughter's name, and um, we did, uh, it was in the, the, this episode this week that, that she kind of rebels against Ray and, and says something really this nasty time? to him. Yeah. She says something <laughs> really nasty to him, and I found myself just like devastated that she'd said this off. And it, it wasn't my coverage, unfortunately. It was her coverage. She said the thing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, f <laughs> And then I realized, oh, that camera's not on me. But that was so devastating. And that was, that was really the things that are, they're, I enjoy the things that are hard for Ray. I just, I don't really like the things that are hard for Liev. Do you save it when it's not on you? Do you try not to react? Well, the, the problem with that is, is that um, for me, is that once I've experienced something, it's uh -huh. like that Heisenberg principle. Uh -huh. Once I've experienced something, I've kind of wrecked it for myself mm. as an actor because then I'm trying to recreate it. Mm. Whenever I'm trying to recreate it, I'm back foot. Yeah. And it's not good mm -hmm. because you want to have the thing happen in the moment. Mm -hmm. And it's usually reactive. It's not. Uh, it's often not when you say your line. It's when you're listening to the other right. person say their line that the thing happens. And when you try to recreate that thing, you're suddenly not in the moment anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not being present, and, and you're not allowing access of the thing that should happen. Right. And so it, it is a problem when the thing happens at the wrong time, and you go, ooh, that's good, i got to remember right. that. Because then you're in the scene remembering instead of instead listening. Instead of feeling it, too, yeah. How, about, how important is the relationship between showrunner and yourself? Because I know you came from film and like you were so, like you said like the, the dynamic between you and the director was crucial and now here's a different setup. This is the age of the writer, I think, you know. 70s was kind of filmmakers and now it's come around to the writer, at least in television it mm -hmm. feels that way. And that's good, you know, I think that has its ups and downs, but in our case uh, we have really great writers and um, I, I like uh, I like the approach that you approach 
um, making television through narrative mm -hmm. rather than character or content or style or you approach it through narrative and I think that's a, that's a smart way to approach television mm -hmm. I think that's part of the success of these shows is that they're for the most part uh, they're driven by writing mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know you, st you you gotta you gotta fight to also keep them cinematic mm -hmm. um, but I, th I think it, I think it's Im important to have a a, a, a a really creative person at the helm I mean, Norman, you've gone, the show's gone through a few showrunners. So like, does it yeah. impact? I would imagine it yeah, does. I liked them all, and they were all different. Um, what happened with that is it made the people back in the camp back in Georgia fight for this thing, and it, it, got, it made us all closer. But um, I think the showrunner is super important to the show. I mean, Scott, the guy that we have now, is so good at planning things out. Frank was kind of a... Uh, a huge personality and had brought what he did and Glenn brought what he did but Scott has his own thing in it, but he's brought this set of structure to the, what was going on down there but I think the crew is hugely important as well um, uh, I mean we, when you have new directors come in for episodes and uh, maybe it's their big thing or their, their break or they have a big idea or something sometimes it takes the crew down there and the showrunner to, to tell that person you know this is this is mm -hmm. what we're doing here um, you know for example like we'll have a director come in and you know there'll be Norman you can stand right here you can stand right here you can stand right here and I'll be like can I just stand around here <laughs> you know and then our DP will you know look, we got him Daryl's always walking around it's like we got him you know so um, they sort of we all having those showrunners lead brought that group closer together mm -hmm. but I think it's hugely important mm -hmm. the showrunner well, and key to making your characters three-dimensional is how they react to other people. Is Do you have, like, a favorite character that your character interacts with? Do you like the way your character is around a certain other character on the show? I love the way Alicia reacts with Eli Gold. Because, I, I mean, Alan Cumming is a dear friend of mine anyway, and it's so rare um, that we get scenes together. But when we do... Um, I think she's constantly shocking him in ways that makes her laugh because to her it's so not a shock, but he's so um, earnest and stern and yet he's completely lost when it comes to Alicia and I think she likes playing him. We just have a really good time together on the set and I love watching. I mean, he used to be Josh Charles, but he's um, no longer with the good wife. <laughs> um, yeah. That was a special relationship. I loved how Alicia and he danced together um, and around each other. But but Alan definitely um, is one of those people. Vera, it's like a tighter circle there, but it's a tighter circle. And of course, I, I cherish the relationship with Norman. I mean, that, that's that that the story focuses on on, on mother and son, mm -hmm. and Freddie is outstanding. But I I really like my um, my scenes when I look forward to all the scenes with um, Nestor Carbonell, who plays oh. Romero. Yeah. And I think this is, what, this is what I respond to your character so much. I think I, I, when you were talking about the fact that you know, he doesn't talk much, I'm thinking, what? He talks all the time. I'm thinking, oh, the, <laughs> what's so beatific about your character, what's so beautiful is that it, it, th there's so much that's unspoken. And subtextually, your character is so rich. Mm -hmm. And you're con you know, you, and that's where, and, and with Romero, it's that similar relation. There's so much that's unspoken. And there's so much subtext. Mm -hmm. It's just drenched with subtext. And there's this magnetism, and and yet they're they're opposites. So it, that I think that one, Romero, John. Uh, yeah, I could answer it in, in a couple different ways, but I think the one that's probably the the, the loaded with the most sort of uh, uncertainty and and history and layers is is the relationship between Don and Peggy. Um, it's it's come so far in, to, uh, from the beginning of the show to where it is now, and yet it's it's uh, it's still uh, can surprise you with its anger and and meanness, its its tenderness and its its uh, vulnerability. Um, I think that's probably the, the the deepest relationship that Don has with anyone on the show, and it's and it's. And it's a work relationship. You know, there is no, there is no family really to right. that. There's certainly no sexuality to that. There's no, 
um, nothing there other than a person who, two people who, who, who believe in each other's creative abilities and talent and yet have a hard time being in the same room together sometimes. Um, so yeah, so, and, and Elizabeth is an incredibly talented actress as well, so it's, it's always fun to, to, to be in scenes mm -hmm. because it's, you, you, it's, you're, you just immediately trust that you're in good hands on the other side of the, of the conversation. Lizzie? You're also tight. <coughs> yeah, uh, well obviously with Michael Sheen, um, because it would be a nightmare <laughs> if I didn't <laughs> like being in scenes with him. Yes. Yeah, which could happen. Yeah. Um, there's time. Mm. But he, yeah, he and I are very much on the same page when it comes to keeping this relationship between uh, Masters and Johnson, this kind of nebulous, undefinable thing from moment to moment. Uh, we never want them to be clearly in love or not in love or have their relationship be in any way obvious to each other or to the audience. Mm -hmm. And so in every beat, we really strive for that. But beyond that relationship, um, I really like working with Julianne Nicholson, who plays DePaul. Mm -hmm. She's ridiculously talented and just a, a wonderful girl, but on top of that, uh, you know, her character has cancer, right. and we go much deeper into that in the second season, and she's just, she's one of those actresses that the lines are so blurred between what's real and what's not that now when I see her, it's just kind of, like, difficult not to mm. cry, because she's so just, like, this... I mean, she carries herself, like, she's so strong. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah she's amazing, but yeah. she's also, you know, she's, a, she's strong, but this kind of just this wound yeah. of a woman when she breaks down there's not you know there's something very very mm -hmm. tough to watch when somebody that strong no. breaks down right. and I don't know anybody who does it better than she does. Norman I feel like if you don't say Carol people uh, will stone Carol. you. It'd be cool. It'd be cool. It'd be cool. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah no I'd probably Carol. I mean Melissa. Mm -hmm. She's uh, she, she just I mean that the character changed with her and I uh, my character changed a lot when they put us together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because of her. She's such a good actress and um, uh, she gets me, you know? Like mm -hmm. she, it's, I, I feel free to be vulnerable in front of her because she, she gets me, like she's my buddy, mm -hmm. you know? Like her, and you can read everything on her face. It just, it's just, just a window, you know? So it's easy to act with her and, and you know, be in something that means something and mm -hmm. not pay attention to anything but that because it's so, Big, mm -hmm. um, probably her. But w I mean, I have special relationships with them all, but that one would be mine. Yeah. Ray, well, oh, Ray, look at me, <laughs> Liev. <laughs> I was. I, were uh, you as bummed as me that you didn't get to be in the scene with uh, John Voight when he was in the towel? Were you there? Yeah, on I set? was actually. Yeah. I was. I was. I, 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 that was a very special scene. <laughs> very special um, scene, yes. For a number of reasons. Yes. But. Uh, you know, while, the f while there are great fireworks with John and uh, with, well, with Mick and Ray's mm -hmm. relationship, I like Ray when he's with, and I enjoy acting with, um, the, the young woman who plays my daughter, mm -hmm. Kara Storcy, who I think is just an amazing actress. And when you're doing this kind of minimalistic riff on masculinity, to see this person with his daughter is really fun. It's mm -hmm. exciting, uh, and I think also being the father of two small children, there's this thing in me all the time that's very easy and pleasurable to access and gives me lots of energy, which is a tenderness. And the tenderness that occurs between the two of them as characters is something that I really love about the show, particularly as in 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 how it juxtaposes the other stuff mm -hmm. in the show. Um, and she's also just a damn fine actress, um, so I would I would say that. We're seeing the kids. I mean, Norman Daryl doesn't have kids, but the way the kids are sort of integrated into the shows, well, show, well, dramas nowadays is very interesting. They have like a heightened part now in terms of revealing stuff about the characters, and we, we saw it with Grace a lot. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about them as parents or? how the kids have sort of uh, moved their stories? 
Well, I think you have to get really lucky, mm -hmm. depending upon how old the kid is when you start. Uh, you know, You're our show, our shows, right? our show's been going on for seven seasons, but it's been it's been the better part of nine years. So, Kiernan was six years old when she started and was a completely different human being. And you don't know that this person is going to develop into this, you know, actress. Mm -hmm. uh, she she might not like to do it, and after a certain um, amount of time. Um, so it's tricky, and, and, and it's tricky for kids, and it's hard to schedule around kids, and there's all the, all the production stuff notwithstanding, but it, it's, it is tricky. And then there's content. You don't want to like expose these kids to like the weirdness that we've exposed to them on our show, but it, it, it <laughs> you know, it's, you know, she's, Kiernan's learned a lot. Yes. Uh, How old is she in real life? She's gonna be 15 this summer. So, you know, over half of her life has been on this show. And, uh, and, and so you, you, you kind of roll the dice, because you obviously you don't know how long the show's going to last, but if the, sh the full run of the show, you're going to have a different mm -hmm. person at the end of the, of the, of the day than, uh, than you had at the beginning. And uh, we've been incredibly lucky to, to, to have found, you know, Karen, we've had five different actors play Bobby. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, boys are harder to kind of wrangle, and, they, they, you know, they, they get, they get, cool. uh, they get distracted much easier, and, and it's, it was, but Kiernan has been a, a, a constant and, and is wonderful. And I, you know, I, I love working with her and have, you know, f from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has been a, a different experience watching her get older. Mm -hmm. and it's certainly easy to, to feel like her father because mm -hmm. I have watched her grow up. Right. Um, and it's been interesting to see her kind of process this world that she's learning more mm -hmm. and more about because mm -hmm. it fits very nicely with the story. Right. Well, Nor uh, Norman, you mentioned earlier planting seeds along the way, and you know, is it ever? Do you ever forget what you filmed in a last episode because you're like jumping far ahead, or you're reading a script that's like, is it ever hard to remember what your character's emotions last were, like where you're coming from? When you're, do you mean when you're actually shooting a scene, or do you mean... Like when you're starting a new episode, but like you're reading a script for a different episode, and you don't remember what, what the last episode was about. Oh, we're on such a tight turnaround <laughs> that we're probably shooting the last scene, and then the mm -hmm. next day we're shooting the... I mean, it, it, for us, it's, we're on, it's a machine mm -hmm. that doesn't stop, so it's pretty close together. Mm -hmm. There's never enough time to forget, unless it's... If it's two episodes ago, then I need to remind myself or ask someone. I always go up to the script supervisor and, and, and um, I find that script supervisors are actually my biggest, um, my best friend on set. Because, because for me it's so much legal dialogue and, and there's, there's um, this incredible relationship I have with Rachel Connors who's our script supervisor. She's an English major. And I always, I, I think our writers do an amazing job and I try to just get the writing exactly as said. And whenever I can't think of something or it's not coming out right, I look at her and I go, it's, I'm not, there's a word I'm not getting. And mm -hmm. we just have this great relationship um, where she keeps me on track. Because I think when you're there every day with that, you know, we do nine to ten pages of dialogue a day. And I, I have to have a support system. I'm pretty good at you know, learning it, and I always feel like it's my job um, as the person who's there the most to show up knowing my stuff mm -hmm. so that, you know, if I can know it after a 15-hour day the day before, then the guest star better know it right. just for coming in for two hours, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I always feel like you have to set up an example for everyone so that, uh, so that we can keep, so that the crew can go home to their families and we can keep it moving and and it also keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. So I, I always feel like that that's um, it's very important to be friendly to your script supervisor and <laughs> and appreciate the work they do. And they keep you on track for, you know, just what time of day it is or who did I just say goodbye to? Because maybe it's three scenes ago. Um, you shot it last Tuesday. Yeah. And you're like, what, and you shot, what am I coming yeah. out of? And what am I going into? And what's the... It's nice to know that you don't have to do everyone's job. When you have a great crew, they're doing it with you. And that's helpful. Are you ever jumbled? Like, what did I just? I, I no. I mean, I it's it's a, it's a similar thing for me as, as Juliana was saying is is that you you have you you want to set an example. You want to be the per you never want to be the person that anyone's waiting on. Right. 
Um, and and it's and it's because it, it can go two ways. If you set a negative example, then that trickles down to the whole rest of everything, and then you, all of a sudden you're not making days, and you're behind, and the studio's calling, and everyone's saying, "What's going on?" But if it goes the other way, and everyone kind of gets inspired, and everyone feels that way, then it then it feels really good. Um, I, I I can't remember. Again, as Juliana was saying, like the. During a season, it's so tight. We don't have time off. We don't have hiatus weeks. We don't have like, uh, it's not three weeks on, one week off. It's right. it's it's nonstop. You know, Fourteen weeks on for us, and maybe there'll be a holiday or something in there. But it's it's pretty nonstop. So I can remember season by season. But then the next season, I, it's like, do you remember that that time where in episode four, and I'm like, which one was episode four? What did I do? Who you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's I that stuff tends to go away. Uh, the order of things, but but you know I don't I don't remember things about my own past, so I, the, the <laughs> '90s are a bit of a blur for me. So you look like you want to say something. Oh, or no, not. no, it's a, I was just agreeing with him. Yeah. Uh, for me, I have I have a I have a great short-term memory, but I can get frazzled, and I, I do rely heavily on my script supervisor, in particular with. It seems it's sort of trended that Tucker Gates, the supervising director, has directed the first two and the last two of the season, and those in particular are because we shoot them at the same time and for efficiency and and and, um, and locations to consolidate locations, we shoot two episodes at a time. And those that's really hard oh. to mm -hmm. yeah. to gauge hard. and remember. Yeah, yeah. They call, there's a name for it. Doubling up. The boarding no, something boarding. Cross boarding. Cross boarding. Cross boarding. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you're gonna talk about crossboarding. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna touch on. Uh, you're gonna talk about wakeboarding. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Snowboarding. That's for later. No, crossboarding. Oh, crossboarding. Only crossboarding. Uh, yeah, we shot the first season or the second season that we're on. We were like a month in, and we shot one and two episodes, one and two together, and then four, and now we're on three, and it's extremely confusing. Mm -hmm. I think if this happened the second half of the season, I would be really screwed, but you know, you come in really prepared at the beginning, but it requires so much work when you get home. Like it's, you know, we don't leave right. work, you know, you go home and you learn the nine pages for the next day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I agree, if you didn't have an amazing script supervisor or, you know, we're starting to figure out which directors work really well for our show, mm -hmm. and I look forward to the days when it's down to like two or three people tops, mm -hmm. because I do think Norman, what you were saying, when the director comes in, I, I think with this amazing time in television, that relationship still hasn't been fully yes. hammered out. The episodic director who comes in and, you know. I think it's the hardest job. It's a really hard job. Doing episodic TV as a director. Because you don't really, I mean, a lot of times it feels like, man, we could probably maybe even do this without a director. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's a machine of its own. And also the, the, cr the, cr the writers, tell the director what they want. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's sort of, I, I, I probably am too empathetic to them, but I always go up to every director that comes. Also, I always find them a little bit afraid. Well, you know your character so much more than I would. And I, and I, I always go up to a director first day and say, direct me. I, I want to see it through someone else's eyes. And it'll give me the challenge to maybe see something differently. I've been doing this character for five years. I'd love to you know, see something different if someone else sees it. If I disagree, I'll let you know, but at least we can try. And that way I just feel like they can relax a little bit um, into what their job is. But I always feel like directors who aren't familiar directors on the show, because we usually have a revolving door of directors. Well, and Josh recently directed, right? He's directed a bit. A yeah, he's, he directed last What's year, that too. Like? I love it. I love being directed by an actor. Mm. I love it, because on television, there's such a time schedule, and it's nonstop, go, go, go. So directors are always like, that was great. Yeah, but actors get behind you as an actor and, and help you with your performance in a way that I think um, they're not afraid to approach a television actor who's been doing this character for a long time. Um, I find every time an actor, Griffin Dunn directs our show, and it's always there's this fresh energy, and they get excited behind the camera watching the actors, and there's, it's, it's sweet and kind, and you feel, you know, supported by them. Leah, you're going to direct an episode, right? Of Indeed, Ray? I am. Are you nervous? It now. Did, did you give him any tips, John? You've directed. Uh, sleep. <laughs> that was the only one. But he knows no, he, that. No, he did. He, he, he actually did give me some good tips. I went for him as soon as we got here. I went right to pick his brain. Mm -hmm. And he, he said some he said some smart things. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you know. What made you want to do it? You want to do 
just experience it from the other side or? Torture, um, torture. Just torture. Boredom, no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, uh, I, I wanted, I do, I was, a, I did want to experience it f from the other side and um, it's like, you know, uh, for me personally, it's like test riding a sports car. In, I, I feel like there's this beautiful machine mm -hmm. that runs really well, and I'm going to try not to crash it. Mm -hmm. But I'm dying to get a ride in that machine, nice. and um, I'm, I'm very grateful that they've allowed me to have a test drive. Ladies, Norman, would you ever want to get behind the camera? I, I, I've directed before, and it, the, contractually, I, I'm, there's what, but, but not for the moment. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why because Carlton Cuse um, does not give you final edit. Mm. And, and I want final edit. I don't think any TV show does. Yeah, no. Really? I mean, yeah. HBO, really? No, no, I don't think any TV show it's does. The, the creative, producer the creative the executive producers yeah. always and have that's, final cut. That's one cut. of the things that I'm finding is it's a completely different exercise. Yeah. And it it's is. a lot like if you've ever done a commercial or something like that. It's, it, in, there are many things that are similar, but they're now so cinematic that you get to do a lot more mm -hmm. and there is there's a tremendous range of possibility and potential especially with the actors mm -hmm. on my program but I think all of them the, uh, have the same situation which is that you deliver it to you give your the showrunner who yeah. delivers it to the studio right. and uh, yeah. ultimately Always. it's the head so of the studio. So many hands it has to pass through. Yeah. yeah I would love to direct my show especially because I mean I haven't directed stuff before and I, I can't imagine a safer environment to give it a shot because yeah. you know get to know these people so well I trust my crew so much that I think it would be a good jumping off point. Mm -hmm. Norman? I mean never say never but I mean, I've directed little weird art films that's all I've ever directed I mean being inside the head of Miles Davis and stuff I, mean, I don't know that I could have that many cooks in my kitchen if I'm making a meal I think it would freak me out mm. but um, never say never. But then, I mean, I mean, I, that show is so like uh, emotion this way, and you get cut off. Emotion that way, you get cut off. We never have long speeches that we say on that show ever. I mean, you start something and something blows up, and you know, <laughs> someone gets killed. I mean, it's it's always emotion heavy. Stop emotion heavy. I mean, that's exhausting. But to my fellow actors on the show. I don't know. I don't know that <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can walk in that water. You know what I mean? Well, people say you learn from your failures, and I remember my first uh, reporting internship. I forgot to get someone's age, and the copy desk let me have it. Not in a bad way, but just always remember to get a person's age. With your first acting credit, do you remember something that like stuck with you that has stayed with you since then? You were like a bartender, right? In, in a Zorro costume? Yes, I was. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, episode of a, of a television show called Providence yes. that was a Friday night television show on NBC starring one Melina Kanakuritas, Mike Farrell, and Paula Kale. Um, I was brought in as a, a guest star who was a bartender. Then there was a, a, a costume party. It was like around Halloween, and then I dressed as Zorro somehow. And I'm sure we'll uh, incorporate a clip around this. Well, point. enjoy. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remember it was it was I was the guest star that day, and it was 15 hour, 16 hour days in the glorious days of network TV when they used to go crazy overtime. Mm -hmm. And it was on location. They had the location for one day. They hard out at a certain time. There were 250 extras, all in co crazy costumes. Melanie Mayron was the director. She was absolutely lovely. And uh, it was the first thing I had ever done. And so I was completely wide-eyed and, and had no, really had no idea what I was doing, vis-a-vis -vis marks, vis-a-vis -vis lights, vis-a-vis -vis standing in the thing, vis-a-vis -vis finding the lens. I was like, oh, my God. Um, and the crew were incredibly kind, and people were incredibly um, pleasant even given all of the things that we had to do, which was get out of this location on time. There were 250 extras that had to go through lunch, lunch again. Um, and and there were, the clock was ticking from the second we stepped on, on, on stage and, and it, or on set. And it was... Uh, Sorry. Got it. Did you? Oh, it's been driving me nuts. Killed. Killed it. Oh, the Olympic plans, yes. Um, and it was it was terrifying, and I think you know the, the sort of learning experience was, uh, you, you know, uh, put one foot in front of the other, and, and at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself at the end of the day, and and uh, 
that's what I just sort of decided to do. And, and don't be afraid to ask people. Like, if you don't understand something, don't be afraid to ask a question. You know, if you, if you sit there and you just clam up and you think, oh, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ruining this or I'm doing it wrong, I'm doing it, it, it's, you, you, you're not going to learn. Mm -hmm. Ask. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly uh, solicitous of, of, of when the guest stars come on. It's like, come on, you know, if you, if you don't feel comfortable, like, let me know. Or, or let someone know because if, you, if you're just going to sit there and, and stew, then you're going to open your mouth and you're not, and, and, and no one's going to believe what's coming out. So mm -hmm. like, let it, let it, let it go, breathe. You're here. You got the gig. We got plenty of film in the camera. Like, let's roll. Lizzie, do you remember any? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a similar thing. My first job was the pilot of Freaks and Geeks, and I had right. one line, and I think I said it like. 2,000 times in my trailer, like putting the inflection on different syllables of my like four word line. And I did exactly what you said. I clammed up and I was super intimidated and I'd never been on a set and all these kids were like clearly best friends and nobody wanted to hang out with me because I was the weird shy girl in the corner who was like whispering this one <laughs> line to myself. Over and over. Your mantra. Yeah. And I think, yeah, probably for the like the first five years of my career, uh, most of what I learned was just observing the leads of the movie or the show that I was doing, and, and I learned a lot about, unfortunately, how not to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I started when I was like 15, and actors and actresses around that age are really something. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, you know, ego that comes with trying to figure out who you are in the world, and also given a lot, give, being given a lot of power on a set mm -hmm. and I saw a lot of really bad behavior and it really informed what kind of actress I hope that I became which is being very you know as as open and conversational with as many people as I possibly can because it really does make a difference and Full I disclosure, think we did a pilot together he, <laughs> got, he got fired off of the pilot <laughs> that's where we met 10 years ago it was Lizzie's fault it was <laughs> I didn't want him there um, but yeah I think and that's like one of the if not the only great benefit of being a struggling actor right. for a really long time, you, you really learn some good behavior tips. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at how nervous looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn on your first I, gig? I, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a movie, but that I, I too showed up and had no clue what I was doing. I didn't know anything, anything. but somehow I booked this movie. and. Um, there was a scene in the movie where the, what happens is the father is in a drunk driving accident and he's in a wheelchair. And all this stuff happens to this kid and the father wheels himself out as the kid's crying and he sort of gets him out of the chair and gives him a hug and it's a big deal. So the director, before we do it, he said, how do you want to prepare to do this? And I'm like, well, what are my options? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? And so I said, give me a cell phone and just come get me in a minute. And Coincidentally, my real father was in a wheelchair and he was dying. So I called him and just had a normal conversation. And then we came out and the first take, I cried so much that so much snot came out of my nose that they couldn't use the take, which I begged them to use, but they didn't. Um, then we did it again and we broke for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, lunch is ruining everyone's... Yeah. And then... Um, and then this group came up to me and I, you know, I just, I didn't go to lunch. I went, I took a little nap in this trailer that's about this big. And this group came up, came up to me and he goes, I know you've never done this before, but, and we were in Maine where it was freezing and people ate in a tent with heaters and stuff. And he goes, the tent was totally quiet and a lot of people weren't eating. And I was like, oh, that's what this is. Like, I, th I was thought this was something else, you know, but I'll never forget that. That was, yeah. I still feel like I'm learning all the time. I've, I don't know, I, you know, Stanislavski type me. I don't know <laughs> any of that crap, you know? And I'm sure it's great, but I just don't know it. I'm mm -hmm. still sort of uh, a new soul mm -hmm. to all this, I guess. But um, that, that day, was, that, was a, that was a big deal. Yeah. Vera? Um, I think, if I remember correctly, like my first gig was um, as a day player um, doing skits on the Conan O'Brien show. And um, uh, so I think that's how I got my SAG card. And, um, and uh, I think the first skit was um, <laughs> playing Conan's pregnant, lactating, scorned girlfriend, <laughs> and basic, <laughs> basically squirting breast milk in his face uh, and having this whole Jimmy rig, uh, and so like, awesome. literally. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I auditioned for that. <laughs> 
and I, I, I'm not sure what I learned from that. Um, uh, but it's, but uh, but uh, th clearly I mean, that a was lot. <laughs> that was in front of the camera. But I think, I think for me, the first time that I really um, felt inept and um, uh, was uh, was was doing theater. I was playing Julia in Two Gentlemen of Verona. Um, uh, in White River Junction Community Theater, Vermont, and, and during one of the dress rehearsals, the director comes up to me and says, you have no sense of irony. <laughs> Whoa. And so I've just <laughs> been working on it since. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Juliana? Uh, my very first TV gig was actually with Chris Noth and Jerry Orbach. And um, it was a Law and Order episode, as every New York actor does. Right. And I just remember, I had never been on camera before. Um, and I remember when they did Chris's, we were in a car. And of course, I was playing Latino, as I always played back then, because they didn't know what to do with me. Um, and I was in a Navy. I was a Navy officer. And I was in the back of his car, and they were in the front. And the camera was on them, their close-ups first. And it was really late at night. We were in the Brooklyn Navy Yards. And I remember them saying, action. I remember watching Chris go and, like, doing this thing that he did. <laughs> and, I, and I'd only ever done theater. So I, I, was, so, I was like, what? How's he? Oh, is that because the camera's so close? See, I, know, I didn't understand where the lens was. Right. I didn't understand what they were seeing. So when they finally turned around to me and they were doing the close-up, I remember being so insecure about my lips <laughs> and thinking that they were moving like that, like doing a little, that I couldn't get the line out because I kept thinking that this <laughs> lip. The twitchy lips. And twitchy lips. I, <laughs> it was so horrible. I was so self-conscious. And on stage, I'd never been self-conscious. You know, on stage, it's sort of, right. there's nothing like this. And I just remember that feeling of like, oh my, and then I got it. I got why he, like, knew, like, I don't know how he did it. I just remember being so taken aback by the idea of right. mugging for the camera. Like, I, 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 to me, that was not what you did, you know? And then all of a sudden, when it was on, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wasn't a good, I'm surprised I ever went back, actually, after that experience. Yeah. My first gig was a Nora Ephron movie yeah. called Mixed Nuts, and I played a, uh, a, a suicidal transvestite. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think the first. It's a great wig. Thank you. Yes. Picked that myself, actually, on really? 14th Street. Before it was cool, Jared. <laughs> 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 yeah. But I, I had the, yeah, I, I, I actually, that was, I made, a, I made a number of mistakes in that role. But I think the biggest one was the choice to wax instead of shave. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> was Should I wax. ask where or no? I'm a very, I'm a pretty hirsute person, <laughs> and it's fairly curly hair. So when you uh, rip it out at the root, not only is it extremely painful, but it, it grows back curly, and you get this, you have this phenomenon called razor bumps. Yes, we all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds really razor bumps. Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, no, 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 wait a Imagine that. Imagine that <laughs> stuff. Imagine, imagine that stuff in your crotch, all over your entire body. Your entire After body the crotch, is one the body gigantic. Imagine all over your crotch on a regular basis. They're at, not. They're not the playing time. the violins. For I, well, I never did yeah. it again, so you I learned my lesson. Well, I think it's only fitting that we sort of wrap things up by talking about the TV's biggest day, Emmys. First of all, are you guys okay with it being on a Monday? Does that bother you? Uh, I, I, it it you're really fine. bothers me. <laughs> bothers me. Well, the only trouble. I think it means we sort of get a day off. Yeah, yeah. that might be nice. I think I'm thinking that's cool because Sunday you got to give up your weekend. You know, if, that's, if you're that's... filming in L.A., if you're filming in New York, and that happens, well, it blows for you. <laughs> it's a tough. It's a tough. It's tough on the production, honestly. Yeah. Because usually you take the red eye back and go to work Monday morning, but when when it's on a Monday, that means you know you lose a day of production. I mean, I don't know how we would do it. We'd probably be doing. Be There's no way they'd shut production down. Why is it on a Monday? Because of football. Oh, football, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but d the drama category is something that we hear people talk about every year about how 
there's just too many good dramas out there and there's five slots and you know what it, what do you make of of how things are expanding and like there's there's not enough room do you think something should be done should should it be more uh contenders or should there be more, like the categ more categories? I mean, and we see the mini series. dramas. Yeah, we see the mini series try to go into drama or com uh, dramas go into comedy to try to find a way in. What do you make of everything? I don't really understand it, to, to be perfectly honest. But y you mean like uh, creating sub more sub? Is that what's happening? They're creating more subcategories. No. Do you think they should just because there's so many good dramas out there and not enough? room on the ballot or is that is it better that way you mean things like best lead actor in television show with the initials ls <laughs> <laughs> works for me you know it's probably why there are so many award shows mm -hmm. and you know for, so that more actors and productions and stories get sort of that pat on the back mm -hmm. that they deserve mm -hmm. so mini series are in with dramas or no but some shows yes, want some to, are. yeah it's, really? yeah some shows enter themselves as strong. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, here's here's where it gets tricky, I think when you're on, when when that happens, like they put True Detective. You're talking about True Detective, right? Yeah, well, and, we see and, it. and we saw it with John Abbey. Langraff came out and said that that was Is that considered a mini series? Well, yes, that's how it was sold on was HBO. Sold. Oh, right, it, it was eight they, parts and those right, actors and yeah. then it was it was a beginning, a middle and an end and it was gone and it then was they the same rationale you used to put American Horror Story in miniseries, right. which is now in its fourth season of its mm -hmm. miniseries mm -hmm. status. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, it's a weird. <laughs> but basically their show, I mean, they had two actors, Woody Harrelson and Matthew McConaughey, who now are done. They did eight episodes and they're done. But they're going to have two different actors. Right. right, but what w the argument is within the industry is that that's considered a miniseries. It's eight episodes. It's actors you're not going to see further on. A series is about an act, these lives of people that you keep following, going through. That's fair and enough. That seems like a separate category. Yeah, yeah. Separate but that's, category. It's, it should. I think it should. And I, I you know, but it, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? It makes it longer, <laughs> though. That's the problem. Is it it also hasn't it. been approved by the Academy, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Academy is, uh, is the one that ultimately makes that decision, and right. it's, it's their, it's their it's party. It's their party. I mean, it's um, all... It, it is what it is. It's, it, it probably gets back to the thing we started the whole thing with, which is that there are so many different ways to present stories at this point, where there used to be just two, mm -hmm. half hour, an hour. And then the very special event miniseries, which was Winds of War, or right, Roots, right, or right. Holocaust, whatever it was. Those were the th th those were it. Yeah. And now there's you know, you, uh, Party Down on on Stars, which is like six episodes that that or uh, for s per season or or you know, ten Downton episodes Abbey on Netflix. Was eight. Breaking Bad is eight episodes. <clears throat> eight episodes. Yeah. And 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 it's so it's it's impossible to kind of yeah. just say it's one thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think it's broken. I think, you know, by nature, you're, any award show is going to have some sort of controversy involved with it because there's, you know, there's always going to be someone who's left out, whether it's the Tony Awards, or the Emmy Awards, or the Oscars, or whatever it is. Um, that's the nature of selecting one mm -hmm. thing as the best. Mm -hmm. But better to have too many than not enough. Right. I mean, the good news is that there's a lot of great shows. Yes, I think that's that's the that's the one thing that that you know that you can take away from it is that we are living in this kind of tall cotton where we get a chance to really uh, watch so much good stuff that's that's enlightening and interesting and funny and uh, and 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 cinematic and and you know it's just it's 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 filling a hole that 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 existed uh, that doesn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And the landscape is changing. I mean, Netflix, it's changing. It's, uh, and everyone has to be open to it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that means there should be new rules, but right now it's, you know, it, it is, is what it is. It is what it is. Well, guys, those were my questions. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry about the little naps. <laughs> <laughs>